Hello everyone, I'm uh, Konstantinos Papachrisou, your host, and I welcome you to another Justin IPSC shooter live streaming. Our Greek viewers uh, should not get confused. This platform is still dedicated to Greek IPSC community. The reason for English language is uh, that because today, tonight, we have a special guest, a well-known shooter, uh, Australian champion in uh, production division with uh, Greek origins. Mr. Hatsiatoni, Paul, welcome. Uh, we are more than honored, than honored to having you here tonight, uh, supporting our amateur effort to, to promote what we love and what we love is uh, practical uh, shooting. Thank you again. Good evening, Kostas, and to our Greek purists, Kalispera, and to everybody else, good evening, good morning, wherever you are. Thank you for having me on the show. It's really good to be here. Okay, uh, before we start, uh, I have to say, I have to apologize for my English because, as you understand, I'm not a native speaker, but uh, never, nevertheless, I'm just the host. You are the guest. The floor is yours. So, Paul, shall we begin? Yes, thank you for... Your English is very good, by the way. My Greek is as good as your English, but I don't know all the technical words, so I appreciate doing this in English. Okay. Uh, now... The first thing we have to learn a few things about you as a person. So the first question will be, tell us a few things about yourselves, about your origins. Okay, so I was born a long time ago, it seems now in 1972, in a place called Rhodesia in Africa, which became Zimbabwe in 1980. Um, I grew up initially in a war zone. It was a civil war time and we were around firearms quite a lot. So shooting, I learned at a very young age. Some of my pastimes there were um, hunting, obviously, um, shooting long rifles, bow and arrows, catapults, anything that shot something ballistic, it was fun to do. And I started shooting competitively at the age of about 15, with long rifle, the 762 by 51 FNFAL, the Belgium, Belgium version, and I represented Zimbabwe at a very young age. Um, moved to South Africa with my family in the early 90s, spent about 17, 19 years there, and moved to Australia, and I was there another 17 years, I think. And then a quick move to Estonia for eight months, and now I'm in Greece. So that's the short, short version of the story. So let's say that it's a quite a, a small odyssey, like Ulysses, uh, setting for, uh, for uh, his Ithaca. So uh, <laughs> what was it that made you take up the sport of practical shooting? And how did you learn about the existence of this particular sport? That is a good question. Um, as I said earlier, I was involved very much in rifle shooting, um, a lot of long range stuff and in the sport that was called in those days service rifle. Um, and when I moved from Zimbabwe, where I began shooting that and excelled at it, I went to South Africa and looked for a club. At that time, the sport had changed a little bit, um, service rifle, and they had moved from the 762 to the 556-223 cartridge and scopes were being allowed and things like that and it wasn't as appealing as it was before with the major caliber if I can refer to it that way so I went looking at clubs and I picked up a sport called silhouette shooting which was with the 22 rifle and at that same club there were people running around with handguns doing IPSC and it looked very very interesting it was also that time when I began running some of my own businesses in South Africa, namely supermarket bakery, eventually a nightclub as well. And being the country it was in, it was good to have some handgun skills. So IPSC looked very interesting from two perspectives, as a sport and as a way to be proficient with a firearm if the need be. 
So I began shooting IPSC then, which was around between 2000 and 2002. If I'm not mistaken, it was two, beginning of 2002. Um, and I was using a revolver because that was the weapon I carried and that was the weapon I chose to use in IPSC until I discovered that it was um, limiting by nature. <clears throat> there weren't many people shooting revolver, although there were more then than there are now. And I progressed then to a para ordinance 40 in standard division. So that's what my origins are in IPSC. So if I understand correctly, uh, you said something about South, South Africa. Uh, that's correct. And uh, one of the reasons is the high criminality in South Africa for carrying a weapon. And then you started to experience yourself in uh, IPSC. Is that, is that correct? That is correct, yes. All right. So, IPSC gave, gave me a good platform for um, practice and proficiency, and it covered two things. It was a good sport to play, it was exciting to play, and it kept you proficient with the handgun. Right now, we, we hear a lot of bad things from uh, South Africa, and uh, generally the situation is not so good over there. Nevertheless, so can you give us a small CV, a curriculum vitae, uh, about your IPSC background and your accomplishments so far? Um, I've been shooting about 10 months, excuse me, <clears throat> in South Africa IPSC when I competed in my first world shoot. And I was very fortunate that the world shoot in South Africa in 2002 was pretty much on my doorstep. Um, doorstep meaning the same country, but it was about 15, 1600 kilometers away north, close to the border of Zimbabwe and South Africa. So I'd been shooting about six, seven months, 10 months maximum. And that was my first world shoot, which I competed in. And I think I came 65% there um, in standard division. So I jumped straight into the fire with that. 65% is um, a, a very good accomplishment for uh, how many months? Uh, maximum 10 months I'd been shooting IPSC. I'm, I'm quite impressed. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I wasn't quite impressed, uh, uh, but I learned a lot from that match. It taught me quite a lot. And I met a few very, very interesting people that are still very good friends of mine. And they helped me a lot. So, yeah, to carry on with your question, um, that was my first world shoot. And I haven't missed one since then, except France. I didn't manage to get to France, um, but I shot every other one from 2002 to date. Um, in South Africa, I don't recall ever winning a national, but I did come very, very close a number of times. 0.2% was one I recall quite memorably. Um, I then moved to Australia at some point and I managed to win the Australian nationals eight times on and off. At some point between those eight times, I did test the waters in open division for a while uh, and came back to production and won a few more times. Eight winnings were all in the production division, correct? Sorry you, were breaking... Sorry, you were breaking up a little bit there. Repeat. The eight winnings that you have in Australian Championship were all in production division, correct? That is correct. That is correct, yes. I won production eight times overall. And in Australia, we have six states and two territories. I hope I'm not getting that wrong. And I've won about 30 state titles, if not more. So these are quite of achievements, of accomplishments. So to achieve, to achieve all of that, you need a lot of practice, obviously. So what, what, was your work, uh, your, what does your workout include in order to inform our viewers, our suitors? There, there's a lot of talk about what needs to be done to get to a level of proficiency where you can be competitive. But that in itself is a whole different can of worms because not everybody's trying to be number one. Not everybody's trying to be the best. Some people are just competing against themselves or competing against the number one person in their grade um, or in their division or in their in the area where they want to be more proficient. But in relation to, to my case, 
I needed to work pretty hard. Uh, as you know, not all of us are dedicated shooters where we can wake up in the morning, go train. We don't have to go to work. We don't have family. So we've got to work around all of that. So I was in a position where I was pretty fortunate owning my own business in Australia. I was out 130 kilometers east of Perth. So I had some space and I would go to work in the morning. I started at 4.20 a.m. Uh, lunchtime I knocked off and I would go straight to the range and I would shoot daily three to 400 rounds. And I'd go back, reload that ammunition because reloading is perfectly legal, legal in Australia and get some rest. Carry on. That's a problem that we have in Greece to reload our own ammunition. Yeah, yeah we'll, a... we'll get to that, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> so go back home, uh, clean the brass, get it ready for reloading, uh, get some rest, reload that ammunition that night, um, and then go back to work and repeat. Um, but at some point, I know people talk about volume not being necessary, but I did find that the more, the more I learned the most when I shot the most volume, and you do need to go through a period of high volume. When I say volume, I'm talking about a lot of ammunition to learn and what that gives you is it gives you constant feedback if you can go to the range with 500 rounds for example and shoot it all out in an hour and a half two hours and i'm not saying just shoot it away have have a proper practice um because the gun's always firing and because you're always squeezing the trigger and seeing the sights you learn the most from this you learn not to react to the sound of the gun going bang so for me, it was important, and I think it is for a lot of people, to actually get that volume done at some point in their development as a shooter. It's, I think it's a, a very important foundation. And there were days I would go and shoot a 1,000 rounds in, in an afternoon in three, three and a half hours easily. And it sounds like a lot of ammunition, but when you have a structured training plan and you've got certain exercises you do, um, that repetition really, really helps to, to ingrain what you're feeling, what you're seeing, and to actually ignore the gun going bang. It just becomes something that makes holes in paper for you where you're pointed. So for me, that was my routine. The, the big round count days were before matches, like state titles, level twos, level threes, traveling away to level fours, sometimes level fives, as you know. And yeah, dedicating yourself to actually shooting some quality uh, volume out is, is what was really helpful for me. I think that the quantity and enough uh, ammunition gives you uh, more confidence. You become more confident with your gun, how to use it, how to, you handle it. And of course, in Greece, we don't have uh, the permission to reload, so uh, we don't uh, waste any bullet. It's a, lux it's exactly. a luxury to, me, to, to waste even one bullet for your practice without aiming or having a specific uh, training program. And since we're talking about uh, training programs, do you have a daily practice routine that you can share with us? At the moment, I'm not in any, any routine. I'm still settling in Greece. But what I used to do was I would definitely do a little bit of dry fire. I hate dry fire, um, but it does help. It does work. Um, I prefer to lie fire in the rain. Uh, I predominantly use dry fire when I'm burning in a new technique. And even though I'm what I consider to be a bit of an experienced shooter, I still change things now and again. I find new ways of doing things. I find more efficient ways of doing things. So dry fire is a part of my routine. I then like to live fire. And, you know, like I said, daily it would be 300, 400 rounds. Um, and then I'd spend some time cleaning the gun, relubricating, checking equipment. And that was pretty much my daily routine, uh, being fortunate enough to shoot every single day. When I was in the city, I would try and shoot three times a week. Um, dry fire would be a separate thing to that. And I'd go to the range Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Then I'd shoot a competition on Saturday and on Sunday. So the practice was three times a week, and I'd shoot a match twice a week. So it's quite a bit of range time uh, and as well running a business managing families and, and living life. So it's, it's quite a bit of dedication. That was my normal routine. Can you give us uh, a percentage between uh, dry and uh, live fire? 
Um, okay, I'll be as honest as I can. Probably 1% for me. One percent dry fire, and that's going to change a lot in Greece, as you know. The ammo situation is is quite a serious one, and it's expensive as well. So, dry fire is going to become probably two percent for me, <laughs> and ninety eight percent. So, no, honestly, dry fire for me is when I need to fix something. I, I keep a diary of, of what I have struggled with on the range, mostly in matches. Uh, for example, last weekend's match, I had a few little issues that I need to resolve. I write that down so that when I go to the range to train, I'm not wasting ammo. I'm actually doing something that benefits me because I've got a record of it. We forget what it is we struggled with. And keeping a diary, say, for example, in my case, I was, again, struggling to hit poppers shooting over the top. I'm going to spend some time when I have a moment and do some practice on that. And even in dry fire, I can practice that by making sure I'm aiming in the right place and not aiming over the top of the, the popper. Do you record uh, your practices? I used, to record. I used to record every single round I shot for five or six years. I recorded the date, the time, the amount of rounds, what I practice and the feedback from what I got out of it. Because uh, as I understand from recording yourself, you can have a lot of lessons learned uh, of the way you're using your gun and uh, your posture uh, and, uh, and other stuff. Nevertheless, what are the, ne what are the necessary uh, preconditions for an athlete who wants to be competitive? Oh, preconditions. Um, I think earlier I mentioned that uh, everybody's looking for something different out of the sport. Um, we may be competing just against ourselves to improve, or we want to be number one, anything in between that. Um, it, it, I think what's needed in all the cases is pretty much the same. You need to have some pretty good equipment, reliable equipment, uh, namely the gun needs to function. You don't want to be clearing malfunctions all the time because that's frustrating and you'll quickly not want to shoot and I've seen that happen a few times with friends and other people. Um, you need to have access to some good friends that shoot or a good coach or someone that's happy to mentor you. That will help and develop your growth a lot quicker than figuring it out yourself. Most times we develop bad habits and once those bad habits are, are set in stone, it's very, very difficult to break away from them. And that's where dry fire comes in. It works very well to break bad habits. Um, you need access to quality ammunition, hopefully quite a bit of ammunition. Um, and you need access to a range that you can attend regularly to, to do the practice. So those are some of the prerequisites. As far as the personal prerequisites, you need to be dedicated. You need to be focused. You need to have the time or make the time. Um, to do your, your training and go to the range. And uh, I think discipline would be the biggest and most important word for me in IPSC. You need to be disciplined enough to learn from your mistakes, be humble enough to listen to the people that are advising you, be wise enough to let some of the stuff go in one ear and out the other if it doesn't make any sense and you've tried to make sense of it. And that's pretty much... Uh, a lot of the bulk of what's needed for the for the good foundation so i'm keeping three words practice dedication and discipline absolutely yes okay. absolutely we yes. have mentioned before about uh, recording ourselves during our uh, practices during uh, games in order to make a small debrief after every practice after every game so we can improve ourselves how can an athlete improve his practice? Other than recording? Yeah. Other than recording? Uh, a training partner. Um, uh, a training partner. Um, I, I do a lot of training by myself. I have in the past. Um, but it does help to have someone that's on the same page as you with the same outlook. I'll give you an example. Um, during the selections in South Africa for the World Shoot team going to Ecuador in South America, me and a very good friend of mine hooked up uh, to train and try and make the South African team, the gold team in standard division. And, and that was a big ask considering we were coming from 
an area in South Africa that was far away from the center. We were 300 kilometers apart, three hours drive apart. And we, we made a pact to train together and work together. And for, for about a year, I traveled 600 kilometers every weekend to go and train with him at a club where we were supported and pushed to our limits to improve. And we both made the team the same, the same year for the same match. So having a training partner is, is, I think, very beneficial. Someone who's honest enough to call out your weaknesses, um, your inefficiencies, and give you feedback that is uh, productive and, and not just destructive, because you can have bad feedback too. Having that training partner, you can have turns, you can test certain things, you can work through um, different techniques together and you can improve at the same time. And when one's lacking, the other one can support and vice versa. It works very, very well having a training partner. So, uh, except of training partner, the majority of the sports are having uh, dedicated trainers. Uh, do you believe in our sport? Uh, what is the importance of uh, the existence of a coach in order to evolve ourselves as uh, as suitors. Do you believe coaching in IPSC? Wow, there's two, there's two important wow, there's two, there's two important points there, and I'll go back to your first few words. Um, a dedicated coach. Um, I've been a dedicated coach to some people, and I think it's worked very, very well for them and me, because you learn both as a coach and the trainee also learns from the coach. It does work both ways. Um, as far as whether it's viable or feasible in IPSC to have a coach like in other sports where people have a coach, we have a number of, of different issues there. Number one, IPSC as a sport, which involves guns, obviously, is not as well known or supported with the same types of numbers as someone who takes up swimming or golf or any other mainstream sports where there's a substantially larger amount of cash involved in sponsorships and corporations uh, wanting their name all over the, the deals with the sponsorship. So there's not that much money floating around. It's a very expensive exercise to have a dedicated coach for a shooter who wants to become better at what they do. So unless you've got good friends who are also good shooters, or not necessarily good shooters, at least good coaches in the sense that they have an eye to see what's going wrong in your technique and they can correct it pretty quickly with the correct terminology that's understandable to each student or each person that's receiving the, the feedback and the coaching. It's very difficult to, in a sport like ours, have a dedicated coach. Having said that, there are some in our sport who do have dedicated coaches. And all the better for them. They're some of the best performers in our sport on the planet. And there's a reason for that. They're absolutely dedicated to what they do. They do have natural talent. They've perfected that talent. And with the coaching they get and the feedback they get, they've become some of the best sports people we have. And, and that's really good to see because we learn from them as well. So the hard work they're putting in, we gain from if we learn and look with our eyes and see what we can grab from that. And these people are available to coach us. So having a dedicated coach on a regular basis, I don't think is viable for 99% of us. Um, the, the affordability of that would be too costly. And, and also the people doing the coaching don't have the time to, to be dedicated coaches to us. Um, some of us have been fortunate enough to, to have some coaching from some professionals or some people who are exceptionally good at coaching in the sport. Um, but I would definitely suggest getting a coach for a couple of sessions to sort out some problems or to at least build the foundation that you need to, to build from there as you become more proficient with your firearm and your techniques and your skills. I would definitely recommend a coach, and there's plenty of them available that are, that are willing to do um, the coaching over one, two, three, four, five days. I recall doing five days straight with Eric Grafal, one-on-one, um, -on -one, and for me, that was uh, really, really good. Having said that, I had Todd Jarrett as a personal friend do my first coaching for me, and, and that was also part of my initial foundation. Okay, for just a small pause, 
because I have to answer why we're doing this live streaming in English. Uh, it's very difficult to put subtitle, subtitles and to adjust the subtitles you need more than five hours for a uh, one hour duration of uh, live streaming. And the second is that we have discussed this with uh, Paul and he was more comfortable to speak in English instead of Greek in order to be more understandable to our audience and to our suitors. Paul, I don't think that you disagree in any of this. Μιλάω τα ελληνικά αρκετά καλά, αλλά δεν ξέρω τις λέξεις στο <laughs> in Greek to explain what I need to explain with the shooting. So as I get out, um, it's hard enough when you're learning as a new shooter and progressing through the sport. And then on top of that, to have issues with equipment. Having said that, there's not a lot of bad equipment out there, but there's some that's better and easier to use and reliable and strong and versatile with good warranties. Um, I think all our equipment is as important as the rest of it. You want a, a holster that holds your gun and it's reliable. You want a gun that works. Um, everything mechanical breaks. There's no guarantees. And you've got to be able to service and maintain those products, be it your holster, your mag pouch, your firearm. And those parts have got to be available um, because we should may be maintaining everything prior to it wearing down and breaking. So yes, I would recommend that um, anybody getting involved in the sport um, spend what they can affordably on the best equipment. Um, yes, I represent a number of companies that have been with me a very, very long time and I'm, I'm honored to represent them. I believe in their products. And I think it's an appropriate time to say that Double Alpha has been with me. We've had a relationship for a very, very long time, I think close to 15 years. Um, CZ makes some amazing firearms that are probably the best value for money available that, that work really, really well and with awesome backup and service. And my new sponsor and people that I work for, Kalkanzakos, who support the sport immensely and, and give us all opportunity to to purchase the things we need and support us in our chosen chosen sport that we like to do. Okay. As you have mentioned uh, during your introduction, you have traveled a lot, quite a lot. Uh, you have competed all around the world, South Africa, Australia, except France. France is a very nice country. You should visit uh, Paul. It's very nice. <laughs> <laughs> I, I haven't competed in France, but I shot for five days with the world champion Eric Graffaldi doing training, and it was beautiful. Um, I missed a match there, unfortunately. So you have competed all around the world. Which match made a special impression on you about? That is a very difficult question to answer because every single match on every continent has some memorable moments. But I would have to stay true to my roots and say that the most memorable match for me and the one that um, emotionally affected me in a positive way was the world shoot on Rhodes Island in Greece. And that was mainly due to the fact that my, my family's from Rhodes Island, my grandfather, grandmother, cousins, aunts, uncles are all from there. And it was really nice to be on the island to compete at the ultimate event of our sport um, on home soil, even though I didn't live here. That was a very, very special time for me. It was something like back to you. Yeah. And I'll add to that. I also shot that world shoot with my twin boys, Savas and Stavros. We shot that world shoot together. It was so their first world shoot. Are, uh, in, uh, in our sport? They were. Um, they had to get on with life and get qualified so they could earn some money. And they 23 years old now and starting to think about getting back into the sport. But yes, they were involved in IPSC quite quite a lot uh, when in you, Australia. When you start uh, this sport in a younger age, you, also, uh, you always have a small break at the age of uh, 20, between 20 and 25. But I believe that majority exactly. return back to the sport. Which exactly. It's an amazing sport. So. Apart from the yeah. uh, from uh, the United States, which country do you think is the most advanced in our sport and why? 
<laughs> this could be a controversial answer, and I've put a lot of thought into it. I'm going to say the Philippines. Um, I've shot there a few times. I think the Philippines is is extremely well organized. Their ranges are amazing. They have so much space. They have a lot of manpower. They're never short of, of ROs. Um, yeah, I've really enjoyed the matches there, and I think they, they've got it really well organized as well. I think that uh, the Philippines are also producing STIs, a part of STIs are constructed in, uh, in the Philippines, I think. And uh, I, I think, I I'm not 100% that. sure, so I don't know, I don't want to, to spread the fake news, but I think STI, but they do a lot of very good modifications in the weapons and the guns. So, yes. They've got some extremely good gunsmiths there. A lot of people get some, some work done there. So, uh, what do you think are the preconditions to boost a country's IPSC? Ooh. Ooh. Um, to boost it. So, I think the availability of shooting ranges is, is definitely right there amongst the top. Um, people that want to shoot need to have access to a shooting range. That's definitely a big one. Um, having access to clubs um, that host IPSC or that affiliated with IPSC. Um, I'll give you an example. There's, there's a few clubs in Australia that shoot various disciplines. Um, and one of them is IPSC. And to shoot IPSC, you have to be affiliated to IPSC. So that club has joined IPSC. You join the club, you join IPSC, and then you can shoot the sport and you compete. You can compete then at level two events and higher. Um, so having clubs that are affiliated to IPSC obviously makes it makes it easier. Um, having some good shooters, I have noticed over the years that clubs that have one or two good shooters in them, all of a sudden start to develop more good shooters, it seems to spread in a good way. Um, the skills get transferred and and the whole club sort of develops and becomes stronger. So that helps a lot too. Um, having a warm, friendly, welcoming environment um, helps. Um, that all siphons down from the club level to the state level and spreads around the country and you all of a sudden have a stronger IPSC and you have strong teams that represent the states in the country and represent the country at national and international level. And I think it all works together well. Um, another thing that's important there is to have good, strong leadership. And we say that a fish rots from its head. Um, it's the same with everything. Having strong leadership at the top that make good decisions, that listen to the, the people beneath them who are, who are affected mostly by, by the decisions. Um, that spreads down to the regional, sorry, it starts at the regional directors, it goes down to the um, section coordinators who are responsible for each state, dub level presidents and chairmen, and down into the shooters themselves. So it's like a pyramid, it starts at the top and it widens out as it gets to the people. And if you have that strong functioning democratic leadership, um, you, you tend to have a good organization which fosters growth um, attracts more members. Um, I always hear clubs saying, we need more members, we need more members, we need more members. And they work very hard to get new members. But nobody's controlling why members are leaving and falling out the bottom um, because they're disillusioned, they're not being looked after, some bad things happen. And as quickly as we're filling in the new membership from the top, we're losing existing membership from the bottom. And with that, we're losing we're absolutely losing the people with the knowledge um, and you wind up with a very diluted, weak system, especially in some clubs where this happens frequently, where nobody knows anything and the blind are leading the blind, excuse the, the pun there, and there's no knowledge and there's no skills because you've lost all the good people at the bottom and you keep filling it at the top with people that don't have those skills and have that knowledge. So all those things add up to making a country, a good IPSC region. And, and it starts with each one of us. We all need to do our bit and we need to 
keep our leaders accountable, keep our club presidents accountable, and that way we can all um, nurture the sport and nurture each other and make sure we, we grow and we don't lose the people with the knowledge. Uh, what about uh, the national matches? For example, I think that after the World Championship that took place in Rhode Island, in Rhode, uh, a lot of things have changed in Greece about IPAC. And I believe that we need also laws that are friendly with our sport. And of course, ambassadors. Totally agree with you. Um, I, I haven't been here long enough to comment too much on the laws, but yeah, I mean, the restrictive rules around ammunition and reloading, that is definitely going to hurt. And, and when you look at some of the quality of the shooters that we do have in Greece, um, uh, I'm, I'm quite surprised that we have some of the skills we have from some of these people because they severely restricted with how much practice they can do. And this relates directly to ammunition and not being able to reload. So yes, less restrictions on that type of thing would help a lot. Um, that's more of an individual progression thing though than, than a, a affecting the development of the sport in the country. But yes, it would help um, being able to have less restriction on that and waiting one year for a for a license to get involved in the, in the sport. Yes, agree with you. Absolutely, he's a, he's a machine. World Shoot 2002, South Africa, my first one, in a town called Polokwane. I was very fortunate to have in my squad a gentleman by the name of Alan Sitter, and he was very good friends with Todd Jarrett. And Todd was in the Super Squad Shooting Open with Saul Kirsch. I don't recall who else was in that squad at that time, but um, through that friendship, I got to meet Todd and... We became quite close, and after the world shoot, I went back to my town in East London, and Todd and Alan and a few other friends wound up in Durban, and the weather was quite bad there. And they phoned me, and they were like, what are you up to? I'm like, nothing. Why don't you come here? We go fishing, and we go do some stuff. And they turned up on my doorstep, and I was uh, very fortunate to have Tom Alan in my home with my family. And Todd made a huge impression on me. I'd been following him for for the 10 months since that I'd been shooting. And um, he gave me my first lesson and corrected a few things that were fundamentally flawed in my technique. And he was very open and willing to share his knowledge with me. And we've been great friends ever since. And he was the first person that made a, a huge impression on me. I loved watching him shoot. He just flowed. Um, and he also coined one of the first phrases that I've, I've always kept and used. Um, he said, the more I train, the luckier I get. So he quantified luck and made it about how much work you put into it, and I love that. So, yeah, Todd was one of the first, and obviously Eric Grafal, um, uh, he's broken all the records there are to be broken. Um, he was an exceptionally, and still is, exceptionally talented, and he keeps improving. Um, and people look at it, and, and they're in awe, and I don't think they realize how much work actually goes into that. When you watch Eric train, um, he, he, he pushes himself hard and his dad, um, Gigi, has a lot to do with that. He, he's an exceptional coach in his own right, as Eric is as well. So those are the two people that have had the most profound influence on me. <clears throat> and I thank them for their friendship and their time. Um, I, I don't feel obligated, but I feel it's absolutely necessary to pass on the skills and to make sure people can develop and achieve what they want to achieve. And uh, I've always made it my mission to pass on what knowledge I do have to those who need it and ask for it. And if they accept it willingly, I'll be there for them and I'll assist them. So I look forward to passing on skills as time goes by. So uh, a provocative question. Uh, Let's go. Because Let's go. sport is very competitive, do you believe that real friendship exists between uh, shooters? 
Oh, absolutely. Um, totally. Um, uh, sorry, a, a, a sincere one. Real friendship. Real friendship. Yeah, absolutely. It does. There's no doubt. Uh, I've seen it with other shooters, <clears throat> excuse me, and I've seen it with some of my friends. Um, there have been occasions in my shooting time especially in the beginning when I started moving up from 70% into the 80s and eventually winning a club level where I did lose a few friends that were at the top of the tree at that time. Um, and some of those friendships were re rekindled and some weren't. And that's the nature of the beast. Um, but I also have some very, very good friends that when we're on the range at a major competition, we absolute rivals and I wouldn't say enemies, but we are to get each other's throats. Um, but off the range and after the match, we will absolutely have a drink together and go off into the sunset together. And we're the best of friends and always will be. There's that mutual respect that um, we push each other and we bring out the best in each other. And that is the best form of friendship you can have. And that applies to not only IPSC, but any relationship on the planet. If you've got a friend, partner, confidant, colleague, whatever it may be that can push you to your limits, um, push the best out of you, highlight the weaknesses in a way that is not demeaning or undermining or not in a bad way to, to bring you harm or, or bring you some fall of some kind, then you have a true friend. And I have a lot of those relationships in IPSC and in my personal life. So yes, to answer your question, there are absolutely real friendships in the sport, and I've definitely experienced that. So uh, I will continue with uh, my provo provocation with the next question. Uh, can you tell us a spicy incident concerning behaviors? A, a big pose, a big pose. Normally people would... <laughs> <laughs> Normally, people would now talk about other people and probably not mention their names, but I'm actually going to talk about myself with this one. Um, uh, some of my friends and I decided we were going to go to one of the European championships, obviously in Europe, and we traveled from South Africa, and things started to go wrong from the beginning. We were all very good friends, and we still are. And... It was a bit of a party on the way to our destination. But when we got to Amsterdam, which was one of our transit airports, um, our luggage never turned up. <clears throat> and it took us a few hours to find out where it was, a lot of phone calls. And it eventually turned up sopping wet. We didn't miss our flight, but it was a big rush to get onto the next flight. And we got to our destination and we knew we had to declare that we had firearms with us. Um, but our luggage was delayed again. For some reason, it was on the wrong airplane or something happened to it. So we had told the authorities we were there, our luggage hadn't arrived, and we were waiting for it, and it arrived four hours later, something crazy. It was sopping wet. We picked up our range bags, and the water just poured out of them. Um, by the way, since those days, I wrap all my magazines and guns in cling wrap and then pack them away just so they don't get wet because the magazines actually rusted from that that uh, rain and being that wet. So when the stuff eventually came, the airport was, there was hardly anyone there at the time we left. I think it was early hours of the morning. Um, we got in, we tried to find someone to say, we've got our bags and that, we were tired and we left the airport and we drove the long way to our hotel, got there, registered for the match, started shooting. And I think it was in the first day of shooting, there was, some issue with us being required to go back to the city because we hadn't declared that we had firearms and the police were a little bit angry with us. So we were escorted back to the city and we all had to go back to the airport. We declared the firearms and we were supposed to return back to the range the next morning for a meeting with one of the heads of the police who wanted to make sure all our permits were in order But unfortunately, we wound up visiting a few pubs in the city, and I think we stopped drinking at about seven o'clock in the morning. And we were a bit late to get back to the range after a few phone calls to find us. We annoyed a lot of people that were trying to help us. And we rushed to the range, and there was a meeting in progress. They were waiting for us, and we were very apologetic and very thankful 
for for them looking out for us and it all got sorted out but uh, there were a lot of angry people about our lack of turning up at the right time to to sort the matter out when they'd gone out of their way for us to to fix an issue that ultimately we had created so that was an interesting situation to be in. Well, sorry, I may say. So, let's change uh, a little <laughs> bit and uh, discuss about uh, fair play in our sport. Do you think that we have fair play? Yes and no. As much as any other sport on the planet, um, we have play that's fair and play that's not fair. Um, we are all human after all. Um, I've experienced fair play and I've also experienced not fair play. And I've experienced that in other sports as well. So, yes and no. When you say... Can no, expand? No, no. <laughs> you know, it's a very diplomatic answer when you say yes and no, because you, you trap the one who's making the questions. No. So, can you give us a small example about fair play? Okay. What do you mean okay. uh, with uh, the word fair play in uh, practical shooting? An example. I, I think the times that I've been most affected by not fair play is when you lose a match that you've worked hard for or to get to and you lose it because not enough emphasis was put on <clears throat> how important the match is. Now, I'll try and quantify what I mean. In Australia, there's a saying, um, someone may be arguing about something and someone will say to them, but we're not playing for sheep stations. Now, sheep stations in Australia are massive, massive, huge properties that are worth millions and millions of dollars. So when someone says to you, look, we're having a game of darts, uh, you lost, but we're not playing for sheep stations. What they're trying to say is they're trying to minimize the importance of the game you're playing by saying, look, you're not playing for millions of dollars here. We're just playing for a beer or we're just having a friendly game. It doesn't mean anything. Why are you so hurt? Why are you so worried? Well, I've got an answer for that, and it relates to IPSC. So maybe for the guy that lives next door to the range who doesn't really care about where he or she finishes in the match and just goes and turns up with no practice and just wants to shoot their gun. Yeah, it doesn't really matter if um, the scoring's done correctly or a competitor's um, shot a procedural and not been scored for it or something's happened. But for a person that turns up at a match that's worked out for three years or for two years in the case of Australia where our selections for world shoot are done over three nationals and there's one national per year, um, it can affect you tremendously. And I'm not saying this happened in Australia, but so you've worked hard, you've spent a lot of money traveling, lots of flights, lots of traveling, lots of hotel rooms, lots of ammunition, lots of guns and parts, and you know, that may equate to 20-30% of your income, never mind the time and the dedication, and you turn up to a match and things are not being done correctly from a scoring point of view or rules are not being adhered to um, from a scoring point of view either, and, and it affects the outcome of your match. And this is where we all need to step up as shooters and we need to know the rules. Too many people don't know the rules and there's some good shooters out there, there's some average shooters out there, there's some new shooters out there. One of the things you need to train is actually reading the rule book. You need to know the rules. And there's some very, very good ROs out there. Um, I'm honored to have them RO me. We've got some beginning beginner ROs out there. and We've got some ROs that don't know the rules either. But because they're range officers and we shooters, and some of us are new shooters, we accept the verdict of the RO verbatim. Now, there was an example this weekend. There was an example last weekend. If the shooter knew the rules, they would have got their points. And it works both ways. Um, you need to know your rules so that you're getting the points you deserve, and you need to know the rules so that you're not getting the points you don't deserve um, and not argue unnecessarily. So, yes, that's fair play. 
um, the, the obligation is not only on the RO to call out what rule he's applying or she's applying, but you as the shooter also need to know the rules so you can actually um, respond appropriately to what decisions are being made about your performance. So fair play is, it works both ways. Everybody needs to know the rules and it's, you need to be versed in what the rules are. Uh, the first thing I thought that is to deny every miss, uh, stating that there are uh, bull two bullets in one hole. <laughs> well, there's, 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 a, there's another side to that as well. You, we always tell the range officer, it's a double. And the range officer will always say, Alpha Mike. So, make sure you gauge it. It never worked. Anyway, so let's... Uh, let's change uh, the, ori the ori orientation again of our questions and uh, talk again about you. Uh, what led you to make the decision to leave Australia uh, and come to your ancestral land, to come to Greece? You're not going to believe this. It was an accident getting to Greece. <laughs> what? <laughs> No, I'm joking. It, it was it was sort of an accident. Um, I'm going to say it was time. Um, everything happens for a reason. Um, my parents tried to live in Greece on two occasions while I was a child, and that never quite worked out. Um, and I think it was just time. I actually feel like I'm home. Uh, I feel comfortable, and. I feel like I'm home, so it's a new beginning for me. It's a new start in, in a number of aspects of my life, not just where I live or shooting, um, and, and I feel like I'm home, so it was time, and I will leave it at that. Okay, fair enough. So, what was your first match in Greece, and what were, what were your impressions about the level and of the match and generally the level of the shooters? Greece was always a holiday destination, um, coming to see the family. So when the world shoot was announced on Rhodes Island, um, that was my first match in Greece, the world shoot on Rhodes. So obviously I was overwhelmed with joy and excitement. Uh, I was very impressed with the organization and the level of proficiency of the ROs. Um, there were a few issues as there always are um, with with having enough time in the day to, to get some shooting done. But other than that, it was very well organized. The Greeks did a fantastic job hosting. We are very good hosts. Greece should be having many more matches of, of higher level than we do. We're an absolutely gorgeous country with the most amazing weather. We have incredible food and philoxenia. And for those who don't know what that means, we, we are very friendly to people who come visit us in our country. And, and we need to really push hard and make, make Greece a, a destination for visitors to come to to shoot IPSC because they get a holiday, they get the sun, they get the sea, they get the food, they get the Greek experience. And really, uh, the, the match in Rhodes was, was my first and it won't be obviously my last, but it was a very memorable match. You didn't say anything about uh, our level, but here comes the question. Here comes... <laughs> Here comes Talk a question about what do you think is your opinion of foreign shooters about uh, Greek IPSC? From my opinion, uh, we have a very we are a very dynamic uh, region with a lot of clubs, a lot of games that are taking place, and we may have a lot of throwbacks. But what is your what is the opinion of foreign shooters that you connect and you discuss about Greek IPSC? Everyone I've spoken to and everybody that I know that attended um, the World Shoot, we'll start with that one because it was my first match in Greece. They were very impressed with the country as a whole. There were some issues getting the guns through customs and some delays at Rhodes Airport. And that happens in a lot of countries. I've experienced that in a lot of places. But generally, everybody wants to come back. I recently did a post on social media where I put a picture up of the Limani on roads and so many people that were at the world shoot were like, gee, we had the best holiday ever in Greece. We can't wait to come back to Greece. 
So not only do they want to come back to, to see the country and experience the country, they also want to come back and shoot. So that feedback in itself is testament to the fact that they had a great time here and they enjoyed the shooting. I've got some friends that come to Greece on a regular basis to shoot matches. I know of one that's come, I think, three times this year um, to shoot matches in Greece. And they will keep coming back. They love it. They have a great time here. They enjoy the company, the food, the shooting. And, and really, we, we really have a time on the ranges in Greece. Everyone is, is really helpful and it's organized and the, the stages are good. And we really have a nice time. I'm enjoying the shooting here. So the feedback I hear and see, everybody wants to come back and shoot a match. Um, we've had Corona, which has created a lot of problems for Greece, being a, a tourist country. People come here for tourism mainly, and no one's been able to come. I shot Canal Challenge, fortunately, this year, and the turnout was pretty low directly because of Corona. Otherwise, the match would have been oversubscribed. And the people that were there from out of the country, and there were a number, um, including me, I came from Estonia to shoot that match. Um, we really, really enjoyed it. It was, it was lovely. So there's not a lot holding us back in Greece from hosting matches. If Corona's under control, um, we can, we can do really, really well. So it's always a very good thing to hear positive uh, feedbacks because uh, this is what we need. We need positive feedbacks. We need ambassadors. Uh, we need. Uh, the good advertisement that uh, will bring something new uh, and a development uh, in our PSC. I know it's a little bit early. Just, 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 just to finish on that one, we, there's, there's a lot of development going on. There's people that are working extremely hard in the background, like yourself. What you're doing for IPSC goes unthanked and uh, your efforts are, are noticed. And there are a lot of other people in the background working really, really hard um, to make this a destination with some really good matches for the foreigners to attend and enjoy with us. So there's a lot of good things to look forward to in the future. So, I know it's a little bit early, uh, but I will ask you the question. Can you make a comparison between, between Greek and Australian IPSC? Yes, let's make a comparison. Yes, let's make a comparison, um, because there are things I can compare. Um, both countries have some exceptionally good shooters um, from my perspective in production. Um, I was challenged in Australia by two or three people on a regular basis that kept me, kept me focused. Um, and in Greece, I've discovered that there's two or three shooters that are, are keeping me on my toes, which is really, really good because without the competition, you can't improve. Um, if you've got nothing to gauge yourself against, uh, you can't you can't work and move forward. So that's really good. Um, as far as comparing the stages, I think we're pretty much on the same level with the quality of our stages. Um, we do have more ranges in Australia um, versus Greece. Uh, a lot more ranges that belong to the clubs. Um, where they're uninhibited in what they do and they host matches on Tuesday nights, some of them on Wednesday nights weekly. Um, some of the big differences that make it a bit easier in Australia, although there's a lot of red tape and compliance, is um, once you've joined a club in Australia, the fees are a bit higher per year, but once you've joined, your attendance to the club, to use the club, to use the range um, for practice, and for level one club matches, is free um, because you're already a member. You bring your own ammo, um, you use a target or two or whatever you need. There's always stages built and you've got freedom to, to train and practice. And there's always an organized club match at least once during the week, normally called a night match. And on the weekend, both Saturday and Sunday, there'll be a club match. Um, in Greece, most people interested in joining the sport and getting involved in the sport have to wait, I think, 12 months. Um, in Australia, it's a six-month waiting period. Um, Australia has six states and two territories, uh, so the country is divided up into eight pieces. And each one has different gun laws and gun rules and regulations. Uh, it's very much like America. So I can only speak about my state and a little bit about the eastern states. Um, 
you've got to wait six months. You have to belong to a club that is affiliated to IPSC to have a handgun, unless you're shooting a different discipline that uses a handgun. Um, and there is a limit on calibers that you can have that are the same, but you can pretty much have um, as many handguns as there are sports to shoot. Uh, we are limited in capacity in magazines. It doesn't matter what division you shoot. You're limited to 10 rounds per magazine. The magazines have to be permanently blocked. Um, so we all shoot 10 rounds in Australia, regardless of division. At least that's not an issue in Greece. But we can reload in Australia, so um, we can make ammunition. There are, however, huge shortages at the moment of powder. People can't get powder. Primers are relatively in short supply. So there's pros and cons in every country you live in and compete in. Um, and that's about all I can compare at the moment. Um, Quality-wise, uh, the standard is there in Greece, and that's very impressive to me because of the the deficit of ammunition or having to use factory ammunition. And that's the other thing as well with the ammunition. We're shooting 136, 137 power factor out of the production guns with some of the factory ammo. And when you reload, you can tailor and manufacture your ammo to run around 130, 129, 28, some people go to which is a lot softer and more comfortable to shoot. So we're doing pretty well in Greece considering uh, the fact that we have to use factory ammunition. Do you move on, uh, but uh, staying at the same limit, level, what, what things can you take from the Australian IPSC and add them in the Greek one? I haven't been long enough in Greece to understand or experience the selection process for level fours and level fives. I know there's always limitations with how many slots are available. Um, I'm not fully aware of how it works here. Um, but I will draw, there isn't, there is no perfect system. What I would like to see happen, and I know this is not happening in Australia or Greece, I think Australia is trying to incorporate it. But one of the systems I was most impressed with was when I was living in South Africa. Um, <clears throat> we had a system for selections that dictated which matches would be used for selection criteria. So you knew in advance that you had to attend match A, B, C, and or D to be eligible for selection. And Armed with that knowledge, you could plan what shoots you were going to go to because affordability is an issue too. But after every result, it was put on a spreadsheet and your best three of your last four were what gave you your ranking and it was purely mechanical. So if you shot 100% at the first match and you were ranked number one, your second match you shot 98%, you still rank number one or number two. And as you know, there's four man teams that get selected. Um, after three matches, if you had some good scores, you didn't have to spend the money and attend the last match because you knew where you were, you knew you were going to be selected. So it gave you some flexibility with how you spent your money and your time in preparation for, for a big match. I'm not sure how it works in Greece, but that's something I try to have incorporated into the Australian system and I believe they're starting to do a spreadsheet that's available to everybody so they can see where they stand. I'd like to see something like that in Greece as well. So you could go online, have a look and see where you stand in the rankings and know what you need to do, which matches you need to attend to try and um, get into that team because it is a privilege to represent your country. And I think a lot of us would be fighting for that position. <clears throat> Other things I would definitely like to see uh, I, I'm told I'm dreaming, but I remember not too long ago when IPSC wasn't very big in Greece, and now we have people shooting rifles, shotgun, and a handgun, and three-gun matches, which is nice to see. I would definitely like to see reloading being a thing in Greece because it will seriously help our shooters improve. Um, at the moment, like you said yourself, every single round you count and you account for um, in your shooting because it's just so hard to, to shoot out the volume that needs to be shot. So I'd like to see that change. Um, and we'll see how it goes. If we talk again in six months' time, I might have a few uh, more suggestions. You're very optimistic uh, when you're saying about uh, six months. 
we have to wait more. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm generally That's optimistic. So, so we'll you see. You mentioned about clubs in Australia. What do what role do clubs play in Australia, and whether it is the same as in Greece? Say that first part again, please. What, I didn't what catch role? It. What role do they play? Do clubs, yeah. Role do they play? For us, for example, it's, it's mandatory to participate okay, in a so club. You have to compete wearing uh, the colors of your club and uh, so on. For example, here in Germany, they don't exist. Uh, they're not the same as we use to think about clubs in Greece. They're completely different. Mostly, they are, uh, it's just the suitor. Okay, so I can give you perspectives from three different countries now. Um, the one that that really, uh, the, the one country that's very proud of its shooters and the dress code is absolutely adhered to is South Africa. So you're not forced to wear your club shirt when you shoot at the club. You can wear anything you want. But the minute you represent your club at another club in a level two match, and level two predominantly means inter-club match, um, you had to represent your club and wear the correct colors. Colors meaning clothing that are provided to you. Um, and you earn that by being a member of that club because that's the club you represent when you shoot a level two. At level three matches and nationals, for example, you wore your state clothing or state colors as we call them. And if you had represented your state in the past, you had a blazer, a jacket that you wore, so everybody was recognizable. Um, and if you represented your country, um, you wore your country's colors, which are the same colors that any other athlete that represents the country wears, because we're representing our country. And if you represented your country, you were awarded those colors with the tie and the pants. You all looked the same. You all looked outstanding, and you walked onto a field or you walked into a stadium and you looked like you represented your country. And, and that, that made you feel very proud, on top of feeling proud to represent your country or your state or your club. In Australia, there was no issue with what you wore when you shot at club level. There wasn't very much interest in wearing jackets or blazers or ties at um, big, big events where you represented your country. But we did have a dress code. Uh, for level four and level five, which was uh, a shirt which was sponsored by um, one of our shooting organizations. And we looked really, really good with their tie and their shirt on, the same pants. Um, it would have been nice to have had a matching jacket for that as well. In Greece, I haven't been here, again, long enough to, to see the code, but you mentioned that everybody wears the club shirt when they compete at the club. Um, yeah, so the dress code is is, is an interesting one. It, it's nice to look like a team when, you, when you're traveling together and you've been selected to represent your club or your state or your country. Um, I want to. I look forward to seeing what that looks like. Uh, I have to apologize. What was the rest of the question? I there? have to apologize because unfortunately I misled to, I, I misled you with my question and uh, especially with my example. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, cool. In Greece, we can wear whatever we like, but we have to respect the club that uh, we are members of. So, uh, mostly, my question is: uh, everything we do in Greece is through our clubs. Uh, and I don't know if uh, this happened to to Australia. Uh, we have uh, the bureaucracy in our clubs, and everything everything goes through our clubs to uh, the. The confederation of the IPAC. I don't know if. Nevertheless. Yes. Look, it's it's the same everywhere else I've been to. Um, you need to. I mean, if you want a gun license, it has to go through your club. Um, we also have to comply with the amount of shoots we do every year to maintain our license in Australia. Um, if I decide to get in my car this weekend to go shoot at a different club. As long as they take visitors or I'm a member of that club, it's fine. In Australia, I can belong to multiple clubs. At one time, I was a member of four different clubs in Australia. Um, there's no issue with that. I believe in Greece, we can only belong to one club. Uh, and this has something to do with licensing, possibly. I'm not quite sure. But, yeah, um, I don't see what the issue is with be belonging to multiple clubs because we support those clubs with our annual membership fee. 
and we can go shoot at them whenever we want to. I was a member of two clubs 4,000 kilometers apart, uh, two clubs in the east side of Australia and two clubs on the west side. And uh, it served me well and it, it also helped those clubs well with having my membership. So no restrictions there as far as where you shoot. Um, some clubs that were full, that had too many members, um, restricted membership and you could only shoot at them two or three times a year as a visitor, sometimes with a small fee, sometimes with no fee before you actually had to join. So the joining of the club was encouraged, even if you were a member of another club. Um, and you didn't only represent uh, one club. If you belonged to a number of clubs, you could represent any club you wanted. That's very different here in Greece, and I'm not quite sure why at this stage. I, can, uh, I cannot answer you, unfortunately. I don't know the specific details. I think that uh, you can register to multiple clubs also in Greece, but I don't know if it's 100% sure, and I don't know the preconditions. Sorry about that. So, uh, sorry for uh, this misleading... We'll find out. Yeah, so we'll find out this misleading question and uh, moving on. Now that you're here in Greece, what is the behavior of Greek, ath of Greek athletes towards you so far? Oh, can I say this stuff online? <laughs> no, I'm joking. Everything's been fantastic. I, I've been, I've been very, very well received. Um, I, I don't think I came here as an unknown quantity. Uh, I think uh, most people know or have heard of me, which is really nice. Um, yeah, the, the, the welcome has been absolutely warm and friendly. Uh, everybody has gone out of their way to assist me and direct me and put me on the right path. Um, everybody's offered their assistance in one way or another, which has been phenomenal. Um, I, I feel like I'm home. I feel like I'm with my people. And, and this is how I like to be as well. So it's nice to feel, um, feel the love and feel the warmth of, of our people. So yeah, it's been really good. And uh, on the battlefield, on the range, um, we throw the daggers at each other, but we're really, really uh, good friends towards each other and we support each other in any way we can. It's been very, very good. You're still on your honeymoon. Uh. <laughs> uh, um, I believe in I believe in working hard to make the honeymoon last. So it shouldn't be any different a year down so, the road. We'll uh, see. You you belong to I think you belong to Athlos. Uh, this is your club right now here in Greece. That's Can correct. Can you give us yes. uh, a few words about Athlos and uh, who you working together? Uh, at your introduction, you said something about Mr. Karkazakos. Says Can you give us a few words? Absolutely. Absolutely, I would love to. Um, Pro System Armory, Kalkanzakos, has been the importer of CZ firearms into Greece for a very, very long time, three generations, if I'm not mistaken. Um, they're a very well-known family, um, exceptionally good people, always doing what they can to assist everybody in any way possible, especially the, the shooting sports, obviously, and promoting IPSC as much as they can. Um, I'm very fortunate and honored to work with them and bring my experience to the table and offer my services to improve IPSC in Greece and improve the service that we can provide in the sense of my knowledge of the firearms and competition, especially in IPSC. And we're working hard to bring more to the shooters and the people involved in the firearms industry. Um, we've got, Athlos is a, a very well-known club. We've got 5,000 plus registered members. Um, not obviously all of them shoot IPSC, but we're working very, very hard to um, improve knowledge about IPSC and bring IPSC to the members so they can at least um, get to see and taste it and, and make a decision from there about whether they want to be involved in the sport or they just want to be a once a month shooter. So yeah, lots of exciting things coming up and very proud to be part of the team. That's good. Due to the fact that uh, Greece is a small, is a quite a small market, do you think that there is space for uh, professional shooters? No. There, I said, no. There, I said it. Um, I don't. Uh, Greece is a very small space. 
And I don't think there is space for a professional shooter to make a living or survive just out of shooting IPSC. I don't see that happening. Having said that, though, uh, sponsorship is, is far-reaching. Um, if there's a person that's good enough, that um, provides what's required, there's no reason why international companies wouldn't be interested in them. And I, I, it's just it's not make a living out of it. It's, it's a give-and-take relationship where, um, like in my case, you, you get to try out new products, you get to use products, and you pass on that knowledge to people who are interested or who have any issues or want to know. So I don't think it's going to happen in IPSC in Greece where a person can be a professional athlete where they actually live off the sport as a shooter. A very different story if you're providing some sort of service, you have a shooting range, a business of some sort, uh, and you happen to shoot, that's a very different story. But talking about your general IPSC shooter, I don't think it's possible now. I think that the even I think that the even sponsorship is very difficult in Greece to sponsor multiple athletes in order to compete uh, the championship because of our small market. Yes, you, you'd be right to say that, and and that highlights the importance of uh, people like um, and we're talking local now. I won't talk international. Um, the Kalkanzakos family who absolutely put quite a lot back into the sport um, in relation to the size of the market. And, and that's really appreciated. And there are other um, uh, retailers out there, wholesalers who do put into the system and put into IPSC, and that's also very much appreciated. And you can witness this at, at big events. You can see who puts stuff on the table and who provides whatever support they can. But yes, you're right. I, I, I don't think it's possible in Greece um, for the reasons we've highlighted. So, Paul, reaching the end of uh, our conversation, what are your goals and plans uh, for the future? Um, my goals and plans for the future are quite simple. Uh, I'm turning 50 next year, so I'm looking forward to shooting in senior category and winning some more President's Medals. Hopefully, win a level four or a level five, that'll be really nice. I do have one very big competitor, Lubisha, to deal with, who's also in scene and is an exceptionally good shooter. So hopefully a podium finish would be nice at some big events. Um, I'm looking forward to coaching, um, helping where I can with some of the new shooters. There's some awesome talent in Greece. Um, at the range last weekend, I was quite amazed at the level of shooters that were just coming out of nowhere that had been shooting and had backed off for during the virus times and all of a sudden they're coming back to practice and, and they're incredible shooters. I'm looking forward to seeing them after they've practiced a bit and they start competing again. I want to help these people reach their potential. Um, looking forward to working with CZ, uh, one of my sponsors and uh, Kalkanzakos Pro System Armory and getting some projects on, on the way that are going to benefit some people and, and be of service to the market. And just generally sharpen my game as, as I move into senior and try and be as competitive as I can. I've got a bit of work to do and I look forward to that ahead. It's going to be exciting. Paul, thank you again for your, pres for your presence here in uh, Justin IPSC Shooter uh, live uh, streaming. Honestly, our conversation was very fruitful. Uh, thank you for sharing your experience, your knowledge, and most of all, your opinion. And I hope you will find your feet in Greece in your new start. And of course, we wish you the best and all Godspeed. Thank you very much, Costas. I appreciate Thank you very much, Costas. I appreciate your time. I appreciate uh, you hosting me. And I'd like to thank everybody out there that's had a hand in in helping me settle in and all of you who know me thank you for watching um i'm available to you and much appreciation to you thank you good night Kalinichta. so uh
thank you for uh, for watching us. Uh, it was our first effort to make uh, a live streaming in English. We have an excellent guest, a well-known shooter, Paul Hanzietonium, and we thank you for that. Uh, thank you for watching for watching us again. Since uh, the next, see you next time. Till then, double alpha shooters.